I'm going to get us started here on the third panel, which is sort of about preparing the next generation. Uh, my name's Jeff Brumfield. I'm a science correspondent with National Public Radio. And I'm not actually sure if anyone knew this when they invited me here, um, but I do kind of have a qualification for being here. I was a physics major, so I've seen firsthand the gender imbalance. Um, and my mother was a feminist archaeologist um, back in the 60s when it really, <laughs> being a female archaeologist was not an easy job. Um, so, so I've sort of had, had some contact with this subject, um, although I am not myself, obviously, a woman. Um, I'm very happy. <laughs> I'm very happy to have uh, two very, very distinguished panelists here with me. Uh, Kimberly Scott is an associate, profe uh, associate professor for Women and Gender Studies at Arizona State University, and director of an NSF-funded program called Compu Girls, which is seeking to get girls um, trained in computational thinking or introduced to computational thinking. It works in Phoenix, in Colorado. Um, and then Ashley Gavin is not Res Reshma Shaujani, am I saying? You're right. Um, but she is the curriculum director for Girls Who Code, which is a nonprofit that, as, as I read it, I think you're trying to get tens of thousands of girls exposed. A to million. A million, million girls by million. 2020. We're going to teach them all how to code. Well, there you go. Um, so I, actually, because I think these, these projects are, are worth talking about, I, I just wanted to let both our speakers start by just telling us a little bit about what they're doing. Um, so why don't we start with you, okay. Kimberly? So I have to preface my remarks um, in response to something that Carol said. Um, I'm that social scientist who always is asking questions. And I apply my work, particularly in sociology of education, um, to my girl, my, to the work that I do with girls. Um, a little bit about my background, I'm an urban educator. Um, I believe in education. I've worked in Thailand in areas that were considered high needs, and I've worked with girls in um, rehabilitation centers. And so my background is not, as you can tell, computer science. However, from all the work that I've done, practical as well as research-wise, I'm invested in how do we not only populate the pipeline, but retain girls, and particularly girls of color, in those pipelines. You know, patriarchy can wear a skirt, one of my colleagues said. And you know, it's true, patriarchy can wear a skirt. And so it's not only about getting more girls or more underrepresented communities into that pipeline, but why don't we change that pipeline? So it's not about necessarily leveling the playing field, at least this is my philosophy. Why don't we blow up that playing field? And so that it's really more reflective of equitable means. And so for me, I look towards culturally responsive practices, the work of Gloria Ladson Billings, for instance, the work of Geneva Gay, um, the work of Tyrone Howard, the work of Asa Hilliard, the work of Teresa Perry, and so many others who are saying that we know unequivocally it, we, we want to increase the academic achievement for underrepresented groups. We need to approach our uh, strategies differently. We need to think about cultural identity. We need to think about race, something that we tend not to. We think we're in this post-racial issue uh, or era for some odd reason. We're not. We need to think about race. We need to think about gender. We need to think about ethnicity. We need to think about language. We need to think about sexual orientation, all those features that make us who we are. And if we don't do this, going to the point that Dr. Valentine said, we're using this, this one unit analysis, and that's unfortunately going to influence our solutions, and our solutions then are very, very limited. And so as I created CompuGirls, I kept these issues in mind, identity, community, um, and challenged the notion of not only having the playing field, but changing it so that it's more representative of our identities along all those lines. I can talk more and more about this, but very briefly, the program is, is targeted to girls ages 13 to 18. Um, the majority of our girls are Latina, uh, Native American, and African American. We are in two states, in Arizona and Colorado. I'm the founder of the program, the executive director. And it's really based on getting the girls not only to feel a sense of belongingness, but also to understand that their identities are not fixed that they can be a technologist as well as contribute to their communities, that they can be African American or Native American, speak a different language, and increase their computational thinking skills while also contributing to their communities in ways that further them. Thanks. And Ashley? 
Uh, how many of you guys know about Girls Who Code? Just curious. Okay, so a bunch of people. Um, I'll just start by saying that Girls Who Code is deeply focused on a commitment to teaching girls computer science. We're not really interested in getting girls. Uh, code is kind of a strange word for those of you who know how to code. There are many different ways to code. Not all of them are computer science. And I think computer science is really, we think computer science is really important to focus on as 70% of the jobs in STEM will be in computing by uh, 2020. And that's going to be 1.4 million jobs. And there are only 8 million high school girls in the nation right now. So putting that in perspective, we need to fill a lot of jobs, and we don't have a lot of people to fill them. Um, and so Girls Who Code offers a number of different programs to young women. It's a nonprofit, so all of them are free of charge. And we, our flagship program is a seven-week intensive computer science course where the girls get through one to two uh, semesters of college-level computer science. Actually, we, I found some questions from the Harvey Mudd exam, uh, the CS101 exam, and we gave it to our girls. And we have an 87% pass rate, and over half the girls get A's. Um, so these girls are really learning how to code, and they're going to be really successful in college. And uh, we also have a deep commitment to diversity, 87% of our girls are uh, students of color, and over 50% are on a free or, re free or reduced lunch program. So that's sort of who we're looking at. And, and our other program is an after-school pro clubs program, which is like our immersive summer program, but sort of extended over many years uh, with volunteers uh, from, from tech industry. Um, yeah, so that's sort of what, and I write the curriculum. That's my job. Well, great. So, Ashley, I wanted to ask you, I mean, we've heard a lot in the earlier seminar, um, earlier in the seminar about leaky pipelines and how there are people, women coming in and then leaving academia and leaving these professions. But, I mean, I think what's really interesting to me is what are the benefits of starting early and, you know, why do we need to start early? Is it, you know... Uh, for multiple reasons, uh, com just like for people, because I really believe that, yes, there are very few women pursuing computer science, but there are also very few people pursuing <laughs> computer science. There are only like 70,000 graduates in computer science every year. It's, it's not just a women problem, it's like a people problem, a real people problem. Um, and I think it's important to start early because most of the fields that people go into, they have some exposure before they get to college. Like English, we all study English before we get to college. We all study history and sort of social studies before we get to college. But like, no one has any idea what computer science is. And so by the time you get to college, you, you develop fear of things you don't know. And therefore, you know, early exposure is really important. And, and another piece of it is getting their friends to get involved. And I know that sounds like really silly, but like the girls who have friends in the program are much more likely to like spread it, it, to continue on. So if they have friends from their schools, they're much more likely to continue with their club. Um, and so I think creating a community around the coding experience and, and just basically lowering the amount of fear that people have is really important. But why do you think it's important to focus on women in particular? That may seem like a dumb question. Right, no, I don't think it's, it's dumb at all. I mean, um, I think, well, first of all, if you, there's this, there's this great statistic. You can see it in the She++ documentary. I don't know if you guys have heard of She++. It's a great little documentary. Um, but they pointed out that if we just uh, got the proportionate amount of women in computer science, all those 1.4 million jobs would be filled. Like if we literally had as many computer science, women in computer science as they represent in college, the, the unemployment problem in computing would be solved. And so like, it's just a massive amount of people um, but more than that, I, I think that women are really, really supportive of one another, especially at Girls Who Code. The, the support uh, network is unbelievable, and they really look out for one another. This is a great story. Um, the, they're so far through our summer program, 180 girls have gone through. And one day I received an invitation to a Facebook group for the girls in the program. And I was like, oh, this is cute. I'll join. There were 155 girls in the group. And it, we don't understand how they all got there because they're from three different states. So like, how could they have possibly found each other? I, don't, I still don't understand how it happened. But they're all you know, pinging each other, being like, can you help me with my homework? Uh, is anyone going to this hackathon? Like, are you submitting to this scholarship? And just like, they are so non-competitive. And I know a lot of emphasis on teaching STEM, especially right now, is like gamification. Like, make it a game, make it competitive. We do the opposite. We do it super collaborative. And the girls are all helping each other. And they see each other as sisters. And lifting one sister lifts another sister. And, and so I think that that's really important, too.
Actually, I wanted to ask you what you think are some of the barriers to getting um, girls into, into these fields early on. Okay. I, I want to go back to your other question oh, also sorry. about why should we start um, with girls and why should we start earlier. Um, there's in uh, social psychology a theory called future time perspective, and one of my colleagues, Jennifer Huseman, is um, one of the leaders. And what we find is that by grade eight, that girls and boys have a pretty good idea as to um, what they want to engage in in the future, and that they also start to involve themselves, for better or for worse, in those strategies, again, okay, for better or for worse, in those strategies. And so what we know from social psychology, and this goes to my point of we have to have interdisciplinary or more transdisciplinary strategies. We need to have more social scientists talking with more um, scientists, talking with more technologists in order to come up with solutions. But we know from social psychology is we got to get them by grade eight at least, as particularly girls, for, they, for them to see themselves in the future and also engage in what we call self-regulatory um, activities and behaviors so that they can say, yes, I can become a technologist, computer scientist, a scientist. And particularly for girls, if we look at the work of the girl effect, if you just Google girl effect, there's been some wonderful research related to why should we invest in girls, particularly in under-resourced communities. What we find is that if we invest in girls, you get, a, you get more bang for your buck. You get more um, impact than if you invest in boys, economically speaking, socially speaking. And so that doesn't mean we should discount boys, but if you want the trickle-down effect, you need to look at girls first. Now, to your question, what are some of the barriers? Um, I think one of the biggest things that I see in the literature, particularly for African American, Native American, Latina, is a lot of times we... Uh, develop these programs, these enrichment programs, and we call them, first of all, intervention programs. And so we approach these communities as if, as if there's something wrong. We approach these communities as if um, there's a deficit. And so then we construct these really weird ways of trying to make up for these deficits. And we do this very specifically, for instance, we don't involve individuals from the community in the intervention because they don't really know what they're doing. We have this idea of certain communities being technophobic. That's Anna Everett's term. We, I mean, and in, if you're in psychology, any psychologists here? <clears throat> no, okay, well, and, and I mean, if you're phobic, there's this, this innate fear of something. Believe it or not, we do think of some communities as technophobic, and we use this idea, unfortunately, to um, have intervention programs that are um, really assuming a deficit approach. Well, if I'm a young lady and I'm coming in and you really don't believe in my community, you're criticizing my background, and you're also not involving my parents, my caregivers, my aunties, then really, how do you see me? So that's one barrier. I think another one is that we assume, again, with the deficit approach, that um, girls, uh, in this case, girls of color, really can't do but owe so much. And so we give very baseline uh, activities. We, we may teach them how to do word processing. We may teach them how to do PowerPoint. But we save those uh, critical thinking computational activities for the other. And that other oftentimes tends to be uh, communities that are more privileged. And so I always question this idea when we're saying, well, we want to increase the number of X, whether it's women or African American or Native American. Let's break that down. Which African Americans, which Native Americans are we really talking about? Which women are we really talking about? And then if we start to get into some of those answers, then we can, protect, we can perhaps think of those barriers less on the individual level, but more on the global level. And then thirdly, a lot of our programs are culturally irrelevant. Um, we teach the girls, um, again, just how to do X and not necessarily how to make the connection of X with why, that why being their communities, their identity, um, and again, their parents, their caregivers. And so we know from the social science literature that girls in particular, or girls in, of color, will be more invested if they see how their efforts can contribute to the community. But we oftentimes don't make that connection for them in our programming. I wanted to ask one more question, then I'm going to throw it open. Um, but we've had a lot of discussion here I'm not sure I've heard the word sexism used. Uh, I may have been out of the room, but you know, it seems particularly relevant to me to ask whether sexism is a problem in these younger ages because, well, I don't know how many people have been on Reddit. You know, a lot of these 
internet spheres can be quite, quite misogynistic. Um, I mean, do you think sexism is a problem, especially as, as girls are making their first contact with the world of coding, with the world of technology? A lot of our young women don't identify it as sexism, or they say, I've not encountered sexism. Uh, but this is like this is a fantastic example of imposter syndrome. Actually, uh, we had our girls uh, speaking on a panel, and they are like crazy eloquent, way better than I am. And uh, the one one of the participants asked, "Are you guys good at coding?" And my girls <laughs> have built crazy, crazy stuff. They have built uh, mobile phone applications that. Uh, can, nap, can help disabled people navigate the subway. In New York, you can't go on Google Maps and figure out which subway stations are disabled accessible. And they created an app to do that and like, you know, did the whole <laughs> the graph search algorithm to like, figure that out and all that. And they were all like, no, I'm not, I'm not really good. I'm probably av average. And I was like, if you were five boys, you'd be like, yeah, I'm good at coding. And like, I, just, I was like, yep. And, and it's that kind of internal sort of like micro in inequities that they face that amount to something bigger. A, a few of them have encountered, frankly, stupid boys uh, in their classes who were like, you're a girl, you know, like you can't code, but not many. It's mostly just the, the sum of, of a lifetime of tiny little, you know, micro inequities that they, that they face. Kimberly, do you want to? Um, I, I failed to, you did a much better job explaining your program. I got so excited about explaining the philosophy. I failed to say that in Convery Girls, we have girls uh, research a social or community issue and use uh, various media to demonstrate their research journey. And so they create video documentaries. They use Scratch to create games or simulations. They build in a virtual world. And so, but the approach is to get the girls to identify a topic that they think is relevant for their community. And then the technology becomes a means uh, as of a way to demonstrate their journey of that topic, the analysis, the, the, what they want the other individuals in their community to do with that information. And so one of the topics was sexism. Many times, many times, we've had over 200 girls go through the program. We've been in existence to, through, since 2007. Um, many girls do talk about sexism, and they talk about sexism um, inevitably in relation to some other ism. So they talk about sexism within indigenous communities. Uh, one of the topics was indigenous language and culture loss. And one young lady created a, a game um, aimed towards younger people in her community to talk about uh, the issue of gender and how that affects and is affected by indigenous language and culture loss. And but so for us in Compu Girls, it's not just about sexism. Inevitably, the girls talk about that ism in relationship to others and then create projects and documentaries and games and simulations to address those issues in really, really interesting ways. They're very conscious about the um, isms and the barriers, but oftentimes they just don't necessarily have the language or the resources to articulate their consciousness. Um, and that's one of uh, the things that we're attempting to do is not necessarily give voice, but provide a space that they can demonstrate their voice and ultimately their ability to become techno-social change agents. All right, uh, questions? <clears throat> so I, I don't mean this at all to be controversial, so I just want to say this in this room is, so we just heard a major speech by President Obama on the importance of women, I think two Fridays ago. And we also heard of the launch of the My Brother's Keeper initiative. And I wonder whether you think that there might be room for sort of a My Sister's Keeper, um, and whether you think that that would be important to raise up to a presidential level, and what, were, what are some ideas that you might have that would be important for something like that, if you think that might be a good idea? I, I think what I like to tell people about Girls Who Code is like, yes, on the surface, it's a coding program, but it's, it's, a, it's a leadership and support it's like a community, and we, we call each other sisters. It just started happening. I, it wasn't like uh, anyone decreed that we would all call each other. It just started happening, and the, and the way we, we treat each other is that any win that I can give to a sister is a win for me, and so we are each other's keepers, and I, and I, I actually did wonder like why um, there wasn't a partner program for my brother's keeper that wasn't my sister's keeper. Um, 
I can't, I don't know why there wasn't, but yes, of course, I think there's room and there should be one. Um, ours is specific to women in technology, but I think any professional woman ha who's been successful has her sisters. I, I have not heard of a single professional woman who's like, yep, I got here by myself. Didn't need help from anybody. <laughs> like, uh, so uh, yeah, I think there's definitely room. I mean, to just clarify, the, the statistics for young African American and Latino and um, Native American boys are dire. And I in no way, shape, or form think that we should take away from that effort. And I think it's really important that we all support that. But I do think that there's something very interesting that we haven't had a major level push on helping each other as women out from someone of the same sort of stature. So is it Michelle Obama? Is it uh, you know Valerie Jarrett? Is it somebody who says stands up and says, hey, you know what? We also really need to make sure that we're supporting our young women as they go through. Yeah, I mean, like even something like the Boy Scouts like came around before the Girl Scouts did. I mean, this has been going on for a really long time. Um, so I definitely agree that we. It's there's no reason why there can't be both. I mean, they're both necessary. I think. And I think I I think that I agree with exactly what you're saying, Kamsi. And yes, absolutely. Um, I was at the White House the day before um, President Obama spoke, and I was there because of the work that we've done um, in terms of Compu Girls. Uh, Compu Girls was honored by the White House as um, changing the landscape as it relates to STEM access. And so it was really an honor to be with nine other awardees who are all working on issues about access and broadening participation, but out of the ten, I was the only one who has a specific focus on girls, and particularly girls of color. But being in that room allowed me to see and also connect with other people nationally who are looking at the issue of race, gender, ethnicity. Um, and at that event, someone did ask the question, hey, shouldn't we talk about girls? But I think just being in that room, accepting the honor, talking to other people, I think there's a growing need. And hopefully, this conversation today can lead to more collaborations. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, my organization works with middle and high school students in general, and you know, as far as computer science goes in particular, how do you get a high school student who's maybe never been exposed, how do you get them to think it's cool or, or make it sexy to the point where they decide to go into it? I take an approach of just like, I try a little bit of everything, and I have a slide deck that I do with with kids and for some kids it's money you tell them especially in the underprivileged communities like money is a huge motivator um, and so you tell them they're the highest paying job out of college uh, for some people's happiness the software engineer is the second happiest employee in in the country uh, preceded by a professor so I guess Maria is probably the happiest person in the room <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, for other people it's changing the world and and that one you have to be a little more creative and talk about things, ways like um, Anne Mae Chang from the State Department is used to work for Google, and now she's taking technology in order to alleviate po poverty in these third countries. Talk about those projects. Um, but more than anything, even though you say this to them, and even though they recognize how cool it is, and you can show them video games, robots, mobile apps, whatever, the thing is, I get all that. It's not for me. Like, I see it. It's awesome. I recognize this is cool, but it's not for me. And I'm very lucky because I, I failed biology, and I was a straight D student in math. So I put my transcript up on the, on the projector. And you're free to use these slides, by the way. And I tell them I majored in computer science. I worked at MIT. And now I'm like teaching a million girls how to code. Um, you probably wouldn't have guessed that based on my math skills. Um, and I tell them I never took calculus. Uh, and like the discrete math class I took, I you know pushed my way through it and got through. And that's what turns a lot of the girls. And to say that it's create, and I show them my artwork, and I'm a stand-up comedian, actually, and I show them that, and it's like, I'm a computer scientist, too. So that's the way that I like to show them. There are a lot of, there's like hour of code is one way, but I prefer a field trip. Like if you can get your kid, and like these tech companies are way more open to bringing kids in than you'd think they are. If you can get your kids on a field trip to any tech company, doesn't even have to be the sexiest one, it doesn't have to be Google, 
like they see a foosball table and they're like, oh my God, because they, they think that it's just a white guy in a basement. I really think they think Twitter is like just a giant series of basements with white guys in it. I, I don't know what they think. It sort of is. It, well, yeah, <laughs> kind of, but there's more foosball and there's more pizza and there's more sunlight. And so like, take, I think that's actually better than, than necessarily showing them a code.org video. Um, because a code.org video, yes, Mark Zuckerberg is like, it's easy, but it's Mark Zuckerberg saying it's easy. That doesn't help you think that it's easy. <laughs> I wanted to do just a brief promo for anyone who's interested in it. We're doing um, a MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, for people who would like to teach uh, an explore computer science course at middle school level or early high school, and it'll be available in the fall. And it's, it's gonna be on edX, it's using Scratch, but it's all of the ideas out of our CS5. And then we hope to have one for our, our intro CS class a year later. So um, if, you, if you want, it's gonna be super fun, and all of the lectures are done by our students, so we have lots of you know, real diversity of kids doing the lectures and the demos. I, everything will be available. You can do all your assignments online. So, um, and of course, it will be free. And there's also Girls Who Code clubs. If you guys want to start a club at your school or your community center, you can get my email and we can start a club. Okay, time for one more, I think. Um, so, Ashley, your transcript sounds uh, really similar to mine, but the difference is I went into journalism. So, I'm wondering what turned it around for you? How did you decide I'm going to? You know, it doesn't matter what I get in math, I'm going to really go for this. There were a lot of signs that I should have been a computer science major. I was like a video game nerd. Um, I loved art, but I did it all on my computer. And so when the computer, the big thing was, the number one thing that changed me was my school started allowing anyone to take computer science and not just high achieving math students. Because there's actually no, the experiment that shows the high correlation between math and computer science is actually flawed because they didn't just have high scores in math, the kids had high scores in everything. So there's just correlation between being smart and doing computer science, which could pretty much apply to any discipline. Um, so, but the thing that really changed is once they opened it up, my homeroom teacher said to me, I'm, he was teaching the new computer science class and he was like, take the class, you should take this. Like I see you on your computer all the time, you should take this. And it, he didn't make it an option. If you make it an option, the girl is not going to take it. You have to make it mandatory and start at a young age. And like that's it. That, that's going to be a huge, like, once we change policy that, so that everyone's taking computer science, it's not going to fix everything. There's still going to be crappy computer science classes out there. But you're just, based on the num level of exposure, you're going to see the numbers change. Well, I'd like to thank both of you again. I think that was great. And uh, thank you. thanks to everyone else.